All righty, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Bisan Abujudi, and I will be your moderator for today. Before we get started, I wanted to share some housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, this conversation will be in English, and there is translation available in Arabic. Uh, the session is one hour long and will be recorded. We'll be sharing the recording after the session along with a recap uh, and relevant resources. And we want this to be a conversation. So please engage in the chat and share your questions in the Q&A. But before we get started, I just wanna invite everyone to share a moment of silence uh, to say a short prayer for the people of Gaza, Wukul al-Shuhada um, and everyone who has lost their lives. So we'll just have a moment of silence. Thank you. And now for today's session. This is the first webinar in a new series that we're hosting at Build Palestine called Mobilizing for Gaza. And the topic of today's conversation is mutual aid. I'd like to start with a short definition. Mutual aid is when everyday people get together to meet each other's needs with this shared understanding that the systems we live in are not meeting our needs and that we can meet them together right now without having to pressure power structures to do the right thing. The people of Gaza have endured more than 145 days of genocide with no water, food, or electricity. More than 1.7 million people are displaced and living in tents in the midst of winter. The situation is unbearable. Some are making the very difficult decision to leave, paying exorbitant crossing fees, while others are remaining steadfast on the land, risking their lives. Everyone is uncertain of their fate. And what we are witnessing today is truly unprecedented. And the response of, of Western governments is despicable. And yet everyday people are coming together, determined to do something. People are protesting, advocating, writing, sharing, donating, trying to help in some way towards our shared goal of an immediate ceasefire, an end to the siege on Gaza, and a free Palestine. The purpose of today's webinar is to raise awareness about mutual aid to support people on the ground, while also addressing the barriers to sending money to Gaza. Our hope is that more people are able to set up trusted mutual aid networks to support our brothers and sisters in Gaza. And I wanna emphasize that mutual aid is not a replacement for humanitarian aid, but rather an addition. The need in Gaza is so immense, the system is completely broken and we are going to need to be approaching the problem from all angles. And with that, I would like to introduce our two guests for today. Joyce Ajlouni is the, secretary, is the General Secretary of the American Friends Service Committee, which works with communities around the world and partners worldwide to challenge unjust systems and promote lasting peace. Welcome, Joyce. Our second speaker for today is Diala Shammas, a senior staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights, where she works on challenging government and law enforcement abuses perpetrated under the guise of national security, both in the US and abroad. Welcome, Diala. So to start things, uh, to kick things off, I'd like to start with you, Joyce. AFSC has been an advocate for mutual aid for many years now. So can you start off by telling us more about what mutual aid is in the global context, how it's different from traditional humanitarian efforts, and why this concept is, go is gaining traction at this particular time in history? Wonderful. Happy to. Good to be with you, Bisan and, and, and Yella and everybody and all our uh, guests. Um, you know, mutual aid is, is uh, it's, it's hard to sometimes draw the line. I just wanted to start with that between humanitarian aid and, and mutual aid, because sometimes they are they, they, they are mixed. Um, but it is, it, as you said, it's, it's about sharing resources, 
um, support vulnerable members of um, communities, but at the same time doing so while um, challenging oppressive systems. And we know we have in Gaza the ultimate oppressive system, and so mutual aid definitely um, comes in. But it, it's really mutual aid in the traditional sense uh, focuses on building solidarity within communities, um, move, moving away from individualistic responses to crises towards more of a collective action. And, and it's not just about providing assistance, as I said. Um, and and it emphasizes the importance of grassroots, community-driven initiatives, prioritizing the needs and voices of the marginalized, etc. And so one major element of um, mutual aid is really around the trust building component because you can't you really can't do it without building trust and fostering collaboration, engaging in inclusive decision making. Um, we'd like to say it's based on the principles of um, equity, justice, and autonomy, empowering community to take charge of their well-being. And so uh, that that there's sort of this community component to it. Um, and obviously, it also comes with challenges because uh, in a place like Gaza, where safety and security are, are compromised in, in such a grave way, you know, one has to also be cautious and, and we have to assess risk, you know, uh, where is this money going to? How is it going to get to people? But at the same time, because the situation is so uh, quickly evolving and uh, our response has to evolve with it to the emerging needs that are changing every day. And so there's a need to be flexible. There's a need to um, coordinate with others um, uh, and, and uh, why, why we do that. So uh, in, in, at AFSC, we have uh, been supporting mutual aid um, initiatives for some time. Uh, we especially saw that um, during the pandemic, uh, where we saw that in, in the United States and around the world, um, resources became scarce, um, people were losing their jobs. Uh, so we, um, we put a lot of energy into supporting communities and, and supporting their own efforts. And I just wanted to emphasize that it's, it's, it's not that we tell them where, uh, where the aid needs to go, but we allow them to explore uh, those, those possibilities as a community. So in Chicago, for example, um, during the pandemic, youth um, decided uh, they wanted to provide laptops and internet service to young people who didn't have laptops when online learning was the way to go. Um, in, in West Virginia, uh, we helped create the Rapid Response West Virginia community where um, uh, people came together uh, to purchase and distribute food. Um, and then there's always uh, a component uh, of mutual aid that has to sort of challenge systems as well. And so um, in West Virginia, while that happened, we also advocated with lawmakers and, and public officials to provide West Virginians uh, an expansion of of healthcare and unemployment and mental health, et cetera. And, you know, and and I think you all know on on the call that um, the you know you saw the that mutual aid actually was happening all around us, right during COVID, uh, with uh, o with food distributions, people running errands for each other, et cetera. And I, and I just wanted to also share that as I thought about mutual aid. I went back to the first Intifada when I was uh, in, in Ramallah, and I, and I felt that you know that was a form of mutual aid. How communities came together to um, grow gardens, to uh, uh, ensure that we stopped relying on uh, our occupier for uh, sustenance. Um, we, uh, when they closed our school, communities came together. Uh, to educate the young people in clandestine classrooms. And I remember being one of those teachers. And so that is a form of, of mutual aid. And if you want to take it even further, before uh, the Oslo so-called peace process, you know, during occupation from 67 um, onwards, when there was no Palestinian authority, um, there was 
a lot of mutual aid at sort of a heightened level uh, in Palestine because we realized that the um, occupation forces that were administering the territories were not providing the community with the services that they needed, be it um, health, education, social services. So a lot of, of that sprung up from the ground up uh, through um, some incredible civil society organizations. Uh, the health system is one that um, you know I'd like to highlight where um, health organizations and committees um, uh, sprung up. They were linked to the um, political factions, but you know uh, that's besides the point. Uh, in the fact that in every village there was a clinic uh, run by civil society is uh, you know taking the role again. That is another aspect of mutual aid is when the system fails, whether it's the government or uh, whatever system is in place uh, to meet the needs, you know, people, um, they, they um, find a way um, and, and uh, to, to, make, to make it work. And so, so there are so many examples of um, how mutual aid, it, it's true, it's different from traditional humanitarian aid, uh, but as I said, the lines are a little murky. And, and in, in Gaza in particular, I want to say that, you know, the rule, book, the rule book for humanitarian aid and mutual aid in their traditional sense is almost doesn't apply because so many elements that need to be in place for humanitarian aid, for example, are not in place in Gaza. And Gaza you know, we, FSC has been doing humanitarian aid all over the world uh, for over a century, right? And we've never seen a situation like Gaza. So our handbook is, is, does not apply. Uh, we have to rely on our staff uh, to be the humanitarian worker. Those same staff are the ones who have also been displaced and, and going through hardships of their own, keeping their families safe and, and uh, you know, and not hungry. And so that that is one, but so we can't go in as uh, external aid workers to offer that aid, and we have to rely on that. It, as well as as you as you're aware, you know, normally in a in a humanitarian situation, something's working. You know, there's electricity, but no food, or food but no water. In, in this situation, there's nothing and and there are also security considerations so that that has made it exceptionally difficult um for afsc we have you know our, our staff in gaza to, to deliver aid yet you know we're 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 um very proud of their efforts that they continue they continue to to do the hard work but i think for for humanitarian aid to to really work regardless of Gaza or not, and I think our model at AFSC has been really incredible, is because we don't, we're not a huge humanitarian aid organization, so we don't have a lot of bureaucracy, which which means we can be adaptive and agile and, and meet the needs of, of uh, the community, but also that we are, we don't do sort of just to use a, a metaphor of, of today, airdrops, like here you go and we're out of the picture. We are, we, we are actually there. And, and because that's important to build, to build um, the trust and um, in, in who we are as an organization. We've been in Gaza since 1948. In fact, we were the first organization to provide humanitarian aid. The UN asked us to, uh, before UNRWA was created in 1948, we were in Gaza doing the, the bulk of the humanitarian um, um, uh, relief effort there. And so, and we continue there since then, so it's 76 years later. Um, and so I think that it's important, I mentioned that because it's important that uh, for humanitarian aid to really, uh, and mutual aid to really work, uh, it's important to, to have that trust in the community and, um, and so, and rely on the local knowledge and uh, not, not do the top down because People know their priorities, they're resourceful. The, the reason AFSC is so successful in Gaza today in providing aid is because we have amazing staff who are so well connected and networked and word of mouth, and they, they know which vendor has cash and with, which vendor has food to sell. And, and, they're, and that's, that's who we have to rely on. And so I think uh, that, that makes it a, um, 
a successful um, endeavor. Um, so it's it's important. You asked the last question about why it's important now, Bisan, and I think uh, more than ever, it's it's uh, you know these creative models for sharing resources amongst our community uh, are more important now than ever because our traditional ways are collapsing, and so we need we need. Uh, uh, to supplement that with alternative uh, ways and and be creative and accept accept that it may not be perfect accept that it there may be some risks uh, that we're taking uh, but we I mean there are ways to mitigate some of these risks but you have to sort of uh, um, do it with with a big heart and just uh, accept that things may go wrong and you might not get it all right but that's what is needed right now. Thanks, thanks for explaining that, Joyce. And I think what's particularly interesting about AFSC or one of the reasons why I personally love um, AFSC as an organization is it, it tends to be on the cutting edge of impact, um, thinking about solidarity, thinking about uh, what else is needed? How do we also approach this from advocacy, um, whether that's about BDS or um, different movements, right? The, yes. the taking a, a comprehensive approach and I think that's something that we, um, you know, really want to emphasize here is like, it's going to require a full holistic approach to, to help Gaza at this critical time. Um, and I love what you shared about how, uh, you know, the, 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 the balance between humanitarian aid and mutual aid and, and a bit of that overlap um, or are those blurred lines between the two and how AFSC, you know, the, the employees themselves are going out finding the vendors almost acting as a um mutual as a mutual aid support network um That's finding true. the vendors finding people in need in their communities and then and then supporting them um so one of the things you know we want people to walk away from this webinar with is uh the the importance of setting up perhaps more mutual aid networks or or at least thinking beyond the 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 very traditional construct of how we are doing aid in Gaza at this time and i want to turn to you diala um to talk a little bit about this underlying fear that many people have when it comes to to supporting Gaza as a result of the weaponization of anti-terrorism anti laws in the US. Can you speak a bit more about the history of these laws and what you're seeing today? Absolutely, and thanks so much for hosting this conversation and for having me on. Um, yeah, so I, I really wanna echo, um, pick up from where Joyce, you know, Joyce was raising this question of the long history of mutual aid in Palestine. And I think it's a really important starting point to talk about the long history of the efforts to cut off mutual aid um, and efforts to support Palestinians. And the two things are obviously interlinked. Um, you know, mu the concept of mutual aid, of course, has really been popularized um, in the United States during COVID. Um, and I think a lot of people started deeply studying this notion um, in a sort of popular way, right? There were really great toolkits that circulated to teach folks what, what is mutual aid. But it is, of course, um, uh, a concept that runs deep in many communities that have never been able to rely on um, the support of the state, for instance. And uh, in the context of Palestine, of course, mutual aid, the concept of mutual aid and these notions of solidarity, grassroots solidarity, and, and connecting, um, supporting each other with political, uh, with building, right, uh, uh, politi po political um, institutions and and forms of support is as as old as as you know our communities itself, right? As well, I would say Palestine itself, um, and so that long history um, is important to keep in mind. And then how in moments of our crises, whether you talk about the Nakba, whether you talk nineteen sixty seven, whether you talk about the Intifada, mutual aid concepts have become core parts of how our history has developed and evolved, right? We all know many institutions in Palestine, um, AFSC, Dada Tifel, like all of these were established that, that have also, you know, and then uh, some of which evolved into the PLO and and, and other kind of core political um, uh, uh, hubs for us. 
have actually started as efforts to support orphans, to support, um, you know, communities in moments of crisis. And this moment with Gaza feels like another one of those historical moments where suddenly we're trying to think about how we support each other and how the diaspora can support people in Palestine. Um, and so because of that long history of, and because of how embedded forms of, I, I don't want to call it international philanthropy because it is really deeper than just sort of philanthropy. It's its core feature of solidarity and nation building. Um, because of that very long history, it's also come under very aggressive attack um, in all sorts of forms historically. And so one of the one of the areas where I work, um, and so I'm just for those who aren't familiar uh, with, you know, the work that, that we do, um, I'm a U.S.-based Palestinian lawyer, um, and, and a lot of the, we, we advise movements um, at the Center for Constitutional Rights, as well as previously, uh, just generally have done a lot of work with social justice movements, in particular the Palestine movement. Um, and one of the core features of this area of practice is advising people on how to safely give money and how to safely engage in political organizing. And the two things are very deeply interconnected, of course, um, for Palestine. And, um, and U.S. anti-terrorism laws are oftentimes the, the nub of people's fears, right? How can I continue to work travel to engage with Palestinians in Palestine without running afoul to a whole set of U.S., you know, scary sounding, hyper-technical laws, um, whether it's in the banking sector, or it's charitable, you know, giving notions, as well as, you know, criminal laws, immigration laws. It's like a whole bunch of things that people are worried about. So um, uh, we, we advise people in this space. Um, but one of the things that our organization and Palestine Legal, which is a group that we work very closely with, have been struggling with for a very long time is a need to have this historical analysis to understand how we got here and now, where, where in a moment like today with Gaza needing everything that it needs and all of our support now, you know, we're seeing UNRWA be attacked and being accused of support for terrorism. We're seeing um, you know, GoFundMe's being shut down and everything in between. Um, but we're also seeing things like um, the Anti-Defamation League calling on uh, criminalization of Palestinian students for material support to terrorism. So all of this stuff that we're all kind of familiar with and just assumed to be part of the reality is actually part of a historically very deliberate process of targeting Palestinian transnational solidarity and organizing. Um, and so we recently released a report with Palestine Legal and the Center for Constitutional Rights to sort of start explaining that long history. And it's not just an academic or intellectual or historical exercise, but it's based on the notion that if we want to be thinking about what the what what our communities need now to be able to meet this moment, we need to and and in order to propose the correct policy solutions, the correct legal interventions, the correct organizing strategies, we need to have an understanding of that history. And I will just, um, and so what our report does is look at the origins of a whole bunch of terrorism laws or anti-terrorism laws in the United States and actually places Palestine at their origin at key junctures. So folks are not necessarily aware of this, but it's really uh, uh, telling right now. The first time the word terrorism appears in US law is actually in 1969. Um, so it's shortly after 1967, and it's in reference to UNRWA. It's in reference to efforts to con condition or limit aid to Palestinian refugees, um, putting conditionality on, you know, uh, where that money can go for and making sure and ensuring that it just can go to what they call guerrillas and terrorists. Um, but actually, it's a form of ensure it was an attack on, you know, uh, on this kind of form of humanitarian support in this institution that is such a core part of, you know, the, the Palestinian refugee experience and, um, of course, the right to return and everything that comes with that. So um, so that's that's literally the first time it appears in federal law. Similarly, if you look at the immigration context, the first time you see restrictions based on, you know, terrorism affiliation come up in immigration law, it's also in reference to Palestinians. This is the first time um, uh, the, the 
the sanctioned designation regime was created, the first designated organization for Palestinian. So everywhere you look, and Professor Daryl Lee is the lead author and researcher um, of this report, everywhere you turn at these key junctures, anti-Palestinian animus is at the core of the development and expansion of U.S. terrorism law. And this is not oftentimes known. People think about anti-terrorism laws with post-9-11 future in the U.S., but actually it's always really been about Palestine. And of course, it has evolved and expanded to uh, to these other sectors um, in this sort of totalizing way that we see it now. So that, you know, activists in Atlanta who are protesting the development of police facility or South Cop City or something they call Cop City, but also being accused of, you know, terrorism. But these this architecture and this infrastructure started out with criminalizing Palestinians. Um, and so the reason it's important to keep in to keep this origin story in mind is um, and Joyce was getting at this with like the differences between mutual aid and humanitarian support, is there's like a very there's been as a result of this long history, a process of depoliticizing um, transnational solidarity and this idea of humanitarian aid and the language and the way that I see it in sort of policy circles is, you know, for many really valid reasons, but that is a deeply apolitical part of, um, uh, of you know, it's, it's, it's an activity that's very deliberately like removed from any kind of efforts to, uh, to build grassroots power, to build political power, to organize your communities, like all of the things that mutual aid are intending to strengthen while also helping children, orphans, feed people, clothe people, all of that. But devoid of all of that, I'm devoid of the political aspect. And when I say political, I mean it in a broad sense. I don't mean political parties and elections and state building. I mean power, right? And so a lot of the efforts to respond to restrictions around material support to terrorism laws and so on and so forth have focused on, you know, create on kind of um, have, have avoided this origin story and have tried to sort of depoliticize it and saying, okay, well, let's just make sure that medicine can get through. And I understand that it's obviously important in moments of crisis to ensure that, um, you know, we, we, we can feed and clothe people. But if you look at the sort of universe of harm that these laws do, it encapsulates far more than just not being able to get people medicine and food and clothes. It actually is about preventing um, a, a much more robust kind of form of transnational work and solidarity. And so I think we have to talk about that if we're going to be, you know, addressing the root causes of this problem. So this is a, a bit of a long roundabout way of saying that was the reason why we put this this report together um, to sort of start engaging um, the impact of communities and primarily Palestinian communities and those who want to be in solidarity with Palestinians um, on this long history and start thinking about what sorts of um, orientation we need to be having these restrictions and these laws um, and 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 not ceding the ground entirely to uh, <clears throat> the more like humanitarian sector or the more you know super narrow focused around reforming these laws and trying to create carve outs. So that's that's really it. Thanks for putting the link in the chat. Um, let's see if I yeah I'll I'll I'll, I'll stop there. Awesome. Yeah. And the, the link is in the chat. I highly recommend that everyone reads this report. It's really, I mean, I learned a lot reading it. And, you know, for anyone who doesn't know, um, Build Palestine back in 2015 actually started off as a crowdfunding platform. And the the thought behind it was, well, if we have this niche crowdfunding platform, if we set up a structure, we follow the laws, we sat down with everyone from the U.S. consulate to lawyers at the U.S. Treasury, registered in the US. And we were like, you know, we can help solve this challenge. And six months after after launching, Stripe actually shut down our account, even though technically we were within all of the rules, but they were like, you're, you're sending money to Palestine and we don't work in Palestine, even though it was a US-based organization. Um, so it's, you know, my personal takeaway from that was that it's, it's intentionally gray and there is so much fear around um, sending to Palestine, even though people, organizations, they want to be doing this work, um, 
but the the legal structure is inhibiting us. And I think that this this white paper is is starting um, a very important effort on the advocacy front. Of you know, we've been working with you know, we've been engaging in the workarounds for for seven eight years now, but the space just keeps getting smaller. Um, the space keeps getting smaller. To whereas today, you know, unless if you're a charity registered in the West Bank. Uh, to run a crowdfunding campaign based in Palestine is almost impossible. Um, and we've seen that happen gradually. So there has to be this advocacy piece as well um, for our community. Um, so with that, I want to I want to I want to hand it over to you, Joyce, to, to share any comments, reflections, and also um, from AFSC's perspective as an organization that's doing the immediate humanitarian, but also the broader advocacy. Yeah, I think that is um... <clears throat> To us what makes the work more effective um because you can't do one without the other and so when i saw when i even mentioned aid mutual aid uh people think about monetary aid food you know and to me aid has to have a wider scope um and so um the fact that we have people on the ground um uh, in gaza on the west bank and here in the us on the hill um, uh, advocating for uh, the rights of Palestinians, uh, whether it's uh, at the moment the ceasefire and humanitarian aid and long-term just solutions and ending apartheid and genocide, all of that, uh, it, it gives uh, the fact that we're on the ground gives us credibility um, to speak from our people who are who are sharing their stories, etc. So it's very important to, to draw those those connections. And I think that uh, from what, what you're saying, Diela, I think you're so right when um, that, that depolitization is taking place at a stark uh, rate where, you know, at AFSC we've been pushing people who are calling for a ceasefire for the sake of saving lives, which is a good thing, but they're not going to the, the next step of, but this is a, this is, did not start in, on October 7th, and there are causes of why this is happening. And there is a, an, an, an ethnic cleansing campaign here and a genocide uh, that has, and that we all have to speak to it. So whether we work within our uh, faith-based community um, uh, or a coalitions, peace-building community where, where we are uh, plugged in and, and networked, that's always been our message is that you, you cannot depoliticize this because th this is really an issue that um, is, is rooted in 76 years of uh, uh, apartheid and oppression. And so we keep calling on that to happen. But I also wanted to, to share sort of the, the reason mutual aid is an, an exciting alternative system uh, for, for sharing resources uh, to me is because it really places uh, a lot of responsibility and gives agency to the people who are have been impacted. And I think that that to me is, is critical. It's uh, you know their self-determination, their power. Uh, and so I think that to me, instead of relying on, external systems for the lack of a better word it's a it's a very decolonized model if you want for aid uh where you're really giving uh the people the space to uh make their own decisions um and what what is uh lovely about uh mutual aid efforts I, I, let's boil it down to crowdfunding at the moment that's one aspect but it's not the only one you know i have been like I'm on this uh, list with wonderful uh, Palestinian American women. We call ourselves the daughters of Palestine. We are like on inst we are on WhatsApp all the time and sharing things. And like there's one effort now where one of the women is collecting um, items uh, from all of us so she can sell. And and when she sells it here in the United States, all these items in the United States, she wants to send the money. Uh, you know, through some uh, trusted means to Gaza. And and so I think there are so many in, in Ramallah, and I've been hearing my husband's there now, he's been telling me 
uh, about certain funds that different families that are you know known and respected in Gaza um, are creating funds that people can uh, send fund money to. And so I think that we do need to rely on what we have, right? And um, we have organizations, and I just wanted to say this before uh, our time end because it ends because it's very important. In Gaza, what also collapsed is the civil society uh, organizations. And, and, and I think that we need to really reconnect with them. AFSC has been uh, reconnecting with, with its sort of historical partners and others as well, because it's important to um, uh, share with them that we still trust them. We want them to really, really lead the way. And so uh, in reinvesting in local partners in Gaza, I know it's hard to find, but there are there. And there are many organizations who have been for decades working in Gaza um, on, on mental health and, and welfare and whatnot. So we need to you know, um, knock on their doors again and, and find them and, 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 and support, support them because it's important that we um, uh, encourage and support uh, the rebuilding of civil society organizations in Gaza as well. And many of them have links with West Bank organizations, Palestinian West Bank organizations. So, you know, my advice is always to look for those, right, um, of, of those organizations that are, you know, functioning and, um, and, and have the links and have found creative means of uh, getting uh, resources and, and, and funds there. It's not, it's not a complete blackout. And so, you know, we are known for our resilience. And so I think we have, we have found creative ways of, uh, uh, getting uh, funding in. Yet, you know, we know, I say that, and I don't want to make it look like it's, uh, it's because we see the numbers and we see that, you know, people are starving to death. And, and, and so the need is much more and it's a drop in the ocean. But I think it's a drop in the ocean. But that's the beauty of mutual aid is that beyond the aid, it's building communities, building power, it's, it's uh, building resiliency. And I think that uh, is uh, just as important as the actual aid that reaches the people. So what I'm hearing is this, the, the risk of depolit depoliticizing aid. And I think it's something that as uh, Palestinians, we have um, fallen into sometimes naively from ourselves, but, but also very intentionally from, from other players, the depolitization of, of impact in Palestine. And that, you know, has led us to, to where we are today, um, you know, with very well-researched um, uh, efforts around how the aid has done more harm than good, because the aid is coming in without um, the, the political context that, that we live in. And um, yeah, Diela, I like how you said, you know, when we say political, we mean, you know, beyond just state building, it's power. So with mutual aid being about extending that power to people, I'm sending you the money and you have the power to distribute that. I'm trusting you to make the best decision there. And, you know, on one hand, it could be to individuals, but Joyce, also what you're saying is to these local organizations, supporting these local organizations, um, helping to rebuild them. But even there, we we run the risk of if I'm going to transfer the money to a local organization in Gaza, there's still the same um, risk of the anti-terrorism laws. So Diela, I, I want us to think long-term. What will it take for us to feel safe giving on a long-term agenda for Palestine and to move beyond these um, to, to move beyond the, the risk that, that we're facing today? Like, what is that long-term solution? It's a million dollar question. And I think some there's some interest in the, in the chat also or in the Q&A about, you know, accumulating um, funds and wealth and, and so on. And I think that's essentially, that's one big piece of it. Um, the reason that we don't have really large or sufficiently large foundations and funds in the diaspora, for instance, to support Palestine 
isn't by accident. It's a feature and not a bug of the system, right? It's what I was saying earlier. That there have been very deliberate efforts throughout history to target forms of Palestinian uh, uh, transnational solidarity, right? The diaspora has been a very key part of fundraising. Um, it's certainly been an important part of the Zionist project, but and Palestinians since the Nakba, but also before, have, you know, uh, done built and uh, networks to support each other um, that were really significant to our ability to survive um, over, you know, more than a century in Palestine. And so those have been attacked. And so, you know, just in the United States, and I don't know where most of the listeners are, are coming in from, but um, really high profile um, prosecutions or criminalization of, of uh, groups like the Holy Land Foundation were intended to teach everyone a lesson, right? To make it feel radioactive, to touch giving to or fundraising to for Gaza or for all of Palestine and, and to, you know, route all of that interest and efforts to um to 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 uh, you know in other places that have less of that kind of power building element or have less Palestinian control. And so we need to counteract that. We need to know that that's been a deliberate process and therefore we need to be getting creative and we need to be resilient in figuring out how we can build our own institutions and expand them. Um, and because the United States and anti-terrorism laws, you know, they don't just restrict what you're able to do here in the United States. They have extraterritorial reach because in order to transfer money, you need to go through a bank and the banks all have branches in New York and, you know, so on and so forth. The financial platforms, Stripe or GoFundMe are all thinking about their liability under these very expansive laws in the United States. So my first answer is we can't just see this ground. We need to have an active, we need to be thinking as a community about how to engage in this area of law and policy that, <clears throat> that actually doesn't restrict our, you know, in the, to use U.S. terms, First Amendment rights, associational rights, all of these things, right? Um, and and I, I don't have like a five-point plan here. I think we are at the very early stages of just, I think right now it's political education and awareness about the fact that we need to be paying attention to these laws. We can't just say, oh, this is a scary technical area and we need to move away from it. Um, so that's like my first kind of, my, my first thought. And then the other piece of it is so much of what I'm describing isn't actually the result of a legal obligation, right? It is not necessarily, it's not legally prohibited to give to people in Gaza. It's just a lot of the hurdles, um, whether it's through the, the banks refusing the transaction, the Western Union is not wanting to send the money, or simply being, of course, setting aside the fact that everyone is bombed and there's no, you know, ATMs aren't working and so on. But there's these other bureaucratic hurdles that are actually as a result of the private sector over over enforcing um, anti-terrorism laws. So because the private sector is risk averse, it's profit driven, and it's going to make a cost benefit calculus. You know, if I continue providing um, services to let's say build Palestine or these crowdfunding or these crowd crowdfunding efforts or this Palestinian organization, you know, relatively it's a tiny fraction of their business model. And then if they're going to be receiving threat letters from, you know, all of these Zionist organizations like Zahor Legal or whatever other, you know, groups have been in the business of sending threat letters to the private sector, um, to funders, to banks, to, to financial services platforms, to social media companies, and um, threatening them with litigation, sometimes actually, you know, following through on litigation, and they're going to make a cost benefit analysis that say, it's just not worth my time. I'm too risk averse. I'm not getting enough money out of this like area. Um, and I'm just going to walk away from the space and I'm going to cut off this client. And so the answer to that is, of course, advocacy with the private sector, um, making sure that they are armed with the information that they need in order to know that actually it's going to be safe. Like that, that that threat letter that they're getting is frivolous, it's baseless, um, and it's just a part of this kind of political process of trying to defund Palestinians, essentially. But the other answer is long-term, if we're really thinking long-term, is what does it mean to have our own institutions that are going to be able to withstand that pressure? 
so that they're not engaging in the same risk assessment calculus. That their in-house counsel is like actually motivated to be creative and find solutions when they receive those threat letters um, or to engage with the regulatory entities to make sure that they can continue providing funding. And that isn't going to happen if you have a totally non-mission driven financial services, you know, sector. Like, what does it mean to have, um, I don't know, our own banks, our own um, money transfer uh, systems, our own, um, our own ability to engage with these regulatory entities that are ultimately a hurdle and ultimately making it harder to give. So that's the direction. I am not somebody that is able to tell you what the answers are. That is really for the sector, the private sector, in collaboration with you know people who know the space to kind of come up with these solutions with. But I do think that the, ultimately that's going to have to be the direction that we move towards. Mm. Yeah, and I think that the the awareness, the advocacy, because even hearing you say that you know this this letter it might be coming from a Zionist organization that then all of a sudden um, the 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 startup or the payment processor gets too scared and will just pull out. Um, so so raising awareness about mm -hmm. what is happening is going to be such an important um, an important piece of this. And and you know is is what you guys started to do with this white paper. So very yeah. grateful for that. Um, I do also want to share that I did share the um, link for an Al Jazeera documentary on the Holy Land Foundation, um, the Holy Land Five, which is here in the U.S. Um, something that there continues to be advocacy around. Um, so if you aren't familiar with their case, I highly recommend um, that you watch that watch that documentary. Mm -hmm. Sam, can I just comment on something? Um, it's um, it's interesting um, to hear uh, Diala speak about um, long term, and but I but I also um, want to emphasize one thing she said about paying attention to these laws uh, because they can come and bite us, and so and that is that is so important. The education and advocacy part is so important uh, for AFSC. You know, we have OFAC to deal with, right, and so we. We have to vet our vendors in, in Gaza and everywhere in the world. We have to go put them through that system, right? And uh, you know, it's in a way we know it's it's silly and it's ineffective. Uh, like, do you do we have control about who is uh, benefiting from our hot meals in Gaza? It's like like you know, we could we're feeding the whole population. You know, it's like can't really vet people, and so. It just give, it, it tells you how what a farce this thing is, uh, especially in in a context like Gaza. It's like how do you control where your money goes when the entire population, no one is immune from needing support right now, and uh, and there's no way of of knowing you know uh, who's uh, who's a Hamas operative and who isn't. And it's like that's that's not what we're there to do. And and we saw. The impact of that with the um, freezing of aid to UNRWA because um, supposedly um, twelve of their staff were accused of, you know, taking part in 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 attacks of uh, of October seventh, and so uh, the implications are real, you know. So you know, so that's, there's a, there's a tap and it was shut off, and so so I think we do need to pay attention, uh, but I also believe that there are solutions like Diella said and, and internal and we need to really if they're not discovered we need to discover them and and we need we need to uh, be resilient i i've been so encouraged to just hear about the different things that people have put in place as i said like uh one family in gaza created a fund and and i know that there have been a lot of questions in in the q a about like how is money uh, being transferred? If, um, do you want me to answer some of that? And I know it's I know it's on a lot of people's minds. So we have not had a problem at AFSC in sending money to our staff, be it their salaries or or, or money for petty cash. But what we have what has been um, really prevalent is uh, e-banking. So people, you know, we we go to a vendor, we want to buy some of uh, their supplies, we send them funds through e-banking. Uh, cash has been depleted in Gaza. There's like nothing. And um, and very rarely you find money changers and vendors who have cash. And when we find them, 
uh, our staff go and uh, transfer money into their accounts, get the cash back. But oftentimes we are charged like up to 10% commission on, on, the, um, on the cash because cash is so hard to find. And so people are working through e-banking and that's what we're doing uh, to get transactions. Uh, but it's, you know, this is a cash-based economy in Gaza as well. And so that's why people are struggling because uh, they can't they can't get the cash and, and, and it's going out of the country by these horrendous, and, uh, uh, outrageous um, uh, fees that are being asked for people to pay to leave the country. And, um, and so that is um, uh, also depleting the, the, the cash uh, because people are taking it with them out uh, as well. So these are real challenges, but um, we need to, while being careful about laws, we also need to focus on resiliency and, and, and creative solutions as well. Yeah, it's this unjust system, right? That, that like the white paper points out, particularly is targeting Palestinian activism, Palestinian advocates. Um, and yet, if you don't operate within the system, you are at risk of getting shut down. Um, and that's why I think it's, you know, we, we have to, if, if there's one thing that I've learned in the last five months is not to lose sight of the long term. Like we have to keep our eye on the long term vision because otherwise the space will just continue to shrink. Um, and, you know, we, we tried for so long to, 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 to do with what's, what's, what's possible, but it's just gotten to the point where it's not sustainable anymore. It's, it's like nothing is possible anymore. So, so we really have to have to be thinking more long term. Um, there is a question in the chat that 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 I want to address around how can Palestinians enhance their resources wealth rather than giving aid, um, which is tied to another one around the current aid systems being rooted in colonial and neo-colonial systems. Um, you know, I'm hoping um, you all can can talk a little bit to that because even even in Gaza, like what I've been noticing with some of the um, humanitarian efforts, they're purchasing. Um, from a farm, like the fact that this farm was still operating in Gaza and that, that there continue to be these, these local means of production in Gaza, um, you know, I just want to emphasize how incredible it is that, that they have stayed resilient, that they have stayed um, on the land and supporting their communities in the midst of like after a 16 year siege um, or a 16 year blockade. So yeah, I would love to hear any thoughts you have around the 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 aid system um, in the context of mutual aid, if you can tying them together. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Joyce, you probably have a lot more to say on this question. Um, I sort of, I just wanted to. I don't want to be non-responsive, Bissan, but I I do just want to say in the short term. Um, and just emphasizing what Joyce is saying around um, around like being careful and diligent, um, it's not impossible, right? Just because there are these huge obstacles and as everybody here is emphasizing like, and Gaza is leading the way, we are eminently resilient and we are very dedicated to continuing finding ways to support our people despite all of the hurdles. Um, and, and so, there are, it's not impossible, it's certainly not legally impossible to be sending money and all of these GoFundMes are an example. People are doing it um, and finding um, uh, ways to continue supporting. I think it is important to not feel dissuaded by um, a lot of the, the hurdles. Do exercise due diligence. Um, there is a resource I put in the chat that's like a sort of primer 101 if you're in the United States, like the, the, the easiest way, of course, to give is to give to a 501c3. That's, a, that's the safest way and let them handle all of the logistics. But also for these more direct forms, it's it's um, it's a, it's just a question of due diligence. Um, you know, these notions of mutual aid that Joyce was uplifting, like trust, actually really go a long way towards what the legal requirements are around knowing your, you know, in, in the banking world, like knowing your customer, but also knowing who, um, knowing enough to know that you are, uh, intending to support, you know, a uh, legitimate and not um, sanctioned individual or entity. Um, there are basic things you can do, like making sure that um, 
recipients aren't sanctioned and there's OFAC lists and so on. So the resource I put in there kind of gives you that 101. It's just important to do that due diligence, do record keeping. And if people have questions around bigger sums of money that they're moving to so definitely got, get, get um, check in with the many sources of legal advice within the community that I'm like, one thing we have seen is like people are skilling up in this, in this sector. The Clear Project um, is one group that I regularly refer people to because they've been doing this for a long time. They're based in New York, but they do pro bono legal advice on charitable giving. Um, so that's that's a resource. So it's not completely off limits. Just know, be careful and know that, you know, important like record keeping and keeping receipts and so on is is uh, important. On the bigger question um, around like how all of aid is like really ultimately a function or how a lot of the humanitarian se sector is ultimately a function of empire. Like, yes, absolutely cosign. This is well outside of my like field of expertise, but I was recently reading a book by Lisa Bung Bungalia um, around, you know, USAID and connecting USAID efforts to, you know, particular forms of, um, uh, you know, US foreign policy, which is not going to be a surprise to anybody um, that and knows anything about this space, but it was a very uh, elucidating book. So I would, that's a kind of a resource if, if this is a space that you're interested in learning more about. Uh, Bissian, I'll comment. I'm looking at the time. I know you're pressed. Maybe you want to take more questions, but I just wanted to say that uh, that that is the beauty of mutual aid is is because it does challenge these hierarchical systems, uh, and 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 I think that and does provide the agency and self determination um, to communities rather than rely on on those external capital systems and etc. That that dictates the terms of support. You know, you, you know, U.S. aid and other. Um, uh, actors, you know, that's that's why AFSC is, is proudly refuses money from USAID and, and, and government entities because we don't want those strings attached and because we do want to make sure that our funds um, go to uh, in, to go to the, those in, in most need. And and what we've seen with a lot of uh, humanitarian and development assistance, as you know, that a, a big percentage of the support uh, goes back to the countries, uh, whether it's through contracts and, 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 and consultancies and, and, and their own people. Um, and so the mutual aid really uh, is a wonderful way because it really keeps resources and redistribu re redistrib redistributes the resources within, within communities and challenges that, that narrative um, uh, uh, that that is out there as well, and so I think that it's important to uh, do more mutual aid type um, work. I think I'd be remiss if I uh, don't make a pitch for AFSC. The humanitarian effort we have um, uh, is really extraordinary with our staff on the ground. Uh, we've already served um, over two hundred thousand uh, people, and we continue. Um, and so it's trying to find creative ways to to get the, the, the other day. I didn't even ask questions. Our staff said that we actually were successful in sending um, uh, aid to the north of Gaza. And I'm like, oh, wow. I was like, how did that happen? And so um, so we again, that's that that is the. Um, uh, the beauty of mutual aid is that we really rely on the on the local knowledge and 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 their own solutions and, and trust in them. And so, um, thank you, Bissan, for putting that uh, link for our uh, donation page as well. Uh, every little bit counts, and, and uh, thank you very much. Many organizations are out there doing amazing work, and we're we're just but one of them. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that that amazing work. Um, you know, as as we're coming to the end of the hour, I I, I want to emphasize the component of trust in mutual aid networks. Um, also, as it pertains to to the legal discussion that we're having, um, you know, on one hand, mutual aid is uh, dismantling the power structure, right, and and it's 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 embedded in this radical trust of people to know what is best for their communities. Um, at the same time, we're operating in a legal framework where there is um, a potential risk. And, and this is where the trust becomes important of trusting who you are in the network with. 
Um, and we'll also put in the chat, AFSC has a great resource on how to set up a mutual aid network. And really it, it comes from knowing the people who you are working with, who you are in, in collaboration with. So I just wanted to um, emphasize that point as we're coming up to the end of the hour. Um, so I want to I want to open it um, to the two of you to just leave closing closing thoughts remarks anything um, that you didn't have the chance to to talk about yet or anything that you want to emphasize and make sure that people walk away with. Yeah, do you want to go? Or? Um, I I need a second. I mean, I think yes. I'll just emphasize that. Um, it's moments of crisis like this that we're facing right now, which is so unimaginable. Um, and we're seeing one of the lead like paths and what we, you know, we at CCR have been from early on calling it a genocide. We've, you know, sued the, the US administration for gen support for genocide. One of the main tools has been cutting off our people from the rest of our people, right? <laughs> and and support and outside efforts, right? So it's not, it's not like it's this is not a side conversation. Um, the conversation about how to support Palestinians in the Gaza is like a core feature of how we are surviving right now. It's, it's a core part of the warfare against Palestinians right now. So it's really important to pay attention to it and also examine deeply the sort of like less visible murkier areas that make this a problem. It's not just a military siege, it's also bureaucratic, financial, and other forms of siege. And I think this is just, again, my my, my plea that we um, we turn on our like, advocacy and long-term thinking around those hurdles in addition to all of the other things that um, our people are facing. Well said, Jella. I, I think my, my last thought, Bissan, is you know, I think I the news about um, Aaron Bushnell and what he did uh, for our cause, his ultimate sacrifice um, in front of the Israeli embassies shook me up in a way and, and made me think about how radical we should be. I'm not saying we should do what he did, but, but that there is a need at this time in our history to really look for radical solutions and really keep pressing because uh, we need to go beyond our comfort zone. We need to take risks. We need to sacrifice some things. And, um, and each and every one of us has one way of doing it. Um, some, some people have big checkbooks and, and that's great and that's how they do it. But and some people love going on the streets. Some people are educators and they, they, they speak to their neighbors. And, and, uh, but I just wanted to make a plug for um, radical action and we need to keep at it um, and find solutions. Don't, we should not succumb to those who are silencing us, not succumb to those who are weaponizing the law to uh, to shut us down and so i think that we we just need to uh continue networking continue trusting continue building our power uh we are at a juncture in our history that um requires it thank you that's so beautifully well said thank you both for your time today uh for all of the work that you do for palestine um for sharing these insights we will be uh, sharing the recording with everyone after the session, as well as all of the resources. There were a lot of resources in the chat um, related to the discussion today. So uh, please expect to receive that um, in the coming days. Um, I do wanna thank all of the participants who joined us today. It's, it's really important that we continue to have this space to, as a community, to think about what is happening, what is still needed, how do we, how do we do more? Um, how do we do it better? How do we find new ways uh, of operating? And that's really what we at Build Palestine are, are committed to. Um, so I wanted to extend an invitation to everyone with us today to consider becoming a member um, of Build Palestine to support our work um, and really like plug into a community. It's a smaller um, community uh, of individuals who are not just plugged into the social innovation scene, but but you know more given more opportunities to interact with with change makers on the ground. 
Um, and there's that link in the chat. Okay, wonderful. Alrighty, and with that, and as, I as one as one of your members, I want to double down on that. And so uh, you're doing amazing work, Bisan and and Build Palestine team. And so uh, we we're behind you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Diella, for your time today. Thank you to all of the participants who were with us for this great conversation. Um, and let's keep advocating for a ceasefire and for a free Palestine. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.